In the summer of 2023, I embarked on a road trip of epic proportions with my brother that would take me from the east coast of the United States all the way to Alaska. This took us across the entirety of the famed Alaska Highway through northern Canada into Alaska itself. Along the way, I heard about various Bigfoot-related stories from the areas I visited. And uh, he gets scared, uh, gets back in his vehicle and uh, peels out of the rest area and it actually uh, chased him and he said it smacked the side of his truck. And then he came across a female Sasquatch with a young one. First off, they heard that young one crying. So they walked to it. So he thinks that he's seen this moose jogging down the side of the road uh, and then it turns and crosses the road and he realizes it's, it's not a moose because it's up on two legs. Throughout the trip, the idea of Sasquatch seemed to loom largely over the journey. Join me for this unforgettable cross-continent voyage on the Alaska Bigfoot Highway. North America as a continent is inconceivably enormous, especially how empty most of it is. It's actually hard to understand unless you've flown over it or driven across it. This is especially true in most of Canada and certainly the state of Alaska. There are many areas that simply have not been explored by humans in centuries, or perhaps never. I've been lucky enough to see many of the remote areas of the United States throughout this Bigfoot Beyond the Trail journey. But now, after having completed this nearly 10,000 mile round trip journey from the east coast to Alaska and back, even I didn't realize how remote most of the continent is. The journey began on the east coast, but we'll fast forward through the relatively boring parts of the drive, which included a few days of non-stop driving through the American Midwest, as well as the Canadian prairies of Saskatchewan and Alberta. This is the world's largest buffalo, apparently. The province of British Columbia is somewhat synonymous with the word Sasquatch as the place where the term originated. Sasquatch is typically associated with regions of southern British Columbia, like Harrison Hot Springs in the surrounding area, as well as Vancouver Island, the extensive rainforests around the endless coastal mountain ranges of the province, and areas bordering Alberta and the southern Canadian Rocky Mountains. Some of these areas will be covered in future Bigfoot Beyond the Trail films, as well as other works by small town monsters. Having been to the area around Harrison Hot Springs, as well as the remote Bella Coola Valley, halfway up the British Columbia coast back in May. But for now, this journey will take us across far northern British Columbia along the Alaska Highway. Spanning 1,390 miles, or 2,236 kilometers, the Alaska Highway runs through northern British Columbia, into the Yukon Territory, and finally into Alaska ending in the town of Delta Junction. The Alaska Highway, also known as the Alaska-Canada Highway, or simply the Alcan, was constructed during World War II by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Built from 1942 to 1943, 
using 11,000 soldiers. The goal was to link the contiguous United States with the territory of Alaska, which at the time was not a state. This was propelled by a fear of Japanese attacks on isolated military installations in Alaska, which could in turn lead to an attack on the west coast of the United States. While such an attack never came to fruition, the highway was indeed constructed and it remains an engineering marvel, especially for the speed with which it was constructed through some of the most remote terrain in North America. Today the Alaska Highway serves as the primary land route from the lower 48 U.S. states to get to Alaska. I had plans to spend a month in Alaska filming not only Dark Coast, but other Bigfoot Beyond the Trail documentaries. And our first destination in Alaska would be the city of Fairbanks in order to attend the Boreal Bigfoot Expo, where we were screening some of our previous Alaska films. So you can say the journey was already off to a start that included Bigfoot, which would seem to be a theme throughout the drive up. All right, here we are, mile zero of the Alaska Highway. We're gonna be starting it out here. Slot Squad just finding a new home. Hmm? Mile zero of the Alaska Highway is located in Dawson Creek, British Columbia. After leaving Dawson Creek, it would mostly be wilderness all the way to Alaska, with a handful of towns and communities along the way. Between Dawson Creek and Fort Nelson, British Columbia, which is about five hours north, there is a history of Sasquatch sightings along the Alaska Highway. This is a map of Sasquatch sightings that was put together by Canadian researcher Carrie Kilmurray. It shows sightings across the country from a variety of publications and websites spanning over the course of decades, even into historical reports. There are quite a few reports on Cary's map near this first stretch of the Alaska Highway, including one sighting from 1965 of a classic road-crossing Sasquatch sighting seen around mile 101. Another cluster of sightings and potential activity occurred near Pink Mountain, British Columbia spanning from the late 1990s and into the mid-2000s, while one sighting from 1999 occurred within the mountains just west of Sikani Chief, in which multiple witnesses described a 15-foot tall Sasquatch near Redfern Lake. The height of such a creature stretches believability a bit for myself, but without many other details about this case in particular, I might chalk it up to perhaps a misidentification of size, which is something eyewitnesses can be prone to do. Beautiful canyon. The water here is some of the nicest I've seen. Just in general, absolutely clean. You know, that's snow fed mountain water. Incredible. I mean, this water's so clean, we probably don't even need to filter it, honestly. <sighs> 
we've reached this pretty awesome looking area of the canyon here. Wow, this area is pretty spectacular. Now looking through all the reports, I haven't seen any sightings or anything from this park. There's sightings north of here and I guess east of here. But this habitat is pretty wild. There probably could be anything out here. We saw moose scat on the way up. This section of the Alaska Highway was probably one of my favorites. Visually, it was something familiar in terms of landscape, reminding me of areas of the Colorado Rockies or even parts of northern Utah, but there was a different feeling. A real sense of isolation, knowing just how far north into British Columbia we truly were, in a part of the Rocky Mountains that is seldom traveled to especially when compared to the tourist-heavy southern Canadian Rockies and the U.S. sections of the mountain range. There's breakfast. Got some uh, sticker mule meal sauce packs. Thanks to Randy Simpson for sending these, man. Really appreciate it. Really convenient little packs to just have out here in the woods. And so for seasoning, we are using some Appalachian Huntsman Butcher Blend. Really cool. Thanks to the Appalachian Huntsman. Picked that up at Monster Fest. Smells awesome. Yeah, we're definitely doing these sandwiches again. Explore this pretty cool canyon we saw off the side of the highway. A little bit of a bushwhack to get to it. It leads up to some pretty epic snowy mountains. There's a cave up here. I think it's just where the water goes. Yeah, it's not really much of a cave. So cool. It's amazing. Towering canyons.
Dude, it goes. The people definitely been in there. There's still snow in there. Really? Does it go further? Can you see? Shine it over there? Notch does. Wow. That's pretty wild. Pretty interesting being in this canyon. We've got a raven that's nest right on that cliff. Seeing all this moose scat right up here in this canyon. I mean, it's a sort of desolate kind of place. How much tree cover up there it goes to show how these moose and these critters really get into everything, into a lot of the aspects of the environment. As we drove on, we began to exit this section of the Northern Rockies. The Leard River itself is actually the official northern terminus of the Rocky Mountains, which is quite impressive considering this mountain chain starts thousands of miles away in northern New Mexico. We made a brief stop here at the famous Leard Hot Springs, which was quite refreshing after all the driving over the past few days. I didn't see it, but there's a moose. Right there, on these boardwalks going to the Leard Hot Springs, there happens to be one right there. How's it feel? Oh, it's nice though, huh? It's kind of nice. According to Kerry's Canada Sasquatch map, just north of the hot springs is an interesting report from 1944 of 16.5 inch footprints being found by the Leard River. The report doesn't contain many other details aside from that, so it is what it is, but I do find it intriguing that it occurred in 1944, at a time well before the concept of Bigfoot was popularized in the late 1950s and into the 1960s. The term Sasquatch would have been somewhat known within British Columbia at the time, but mostly associated with the Harrison Hot Springs area, at the far southern end of the province, while these tracks were found at the far northern end of British Columbia, over 1,000 miles away from Harrison Hot Springs. Also, it is curious to note about this finding being reported in 1944, which would have been right after the construction of the Alaska Highway. This makes me wonder if at the time of construction, any encounters took place, given this road was being built in some extremely remote areas. I did a little bit of digging on this, but found no leads. So this is likely something we may never know about. After departing the Leard Hot Springs area, we had a final stretch of British Columbia to drive until we crossed into the Yukon Territory. This stretch would prove to be teeming with wildlife and probably the most amount of bears I've seen in just a couple of hours.
Bottle squash location number two. What's up, buddy? <laughs> so this is the signpost forest. People put up signs from around the world. Here it's huge. I don't know how many signs there are, but there is a lot. All kinds of stuff. San Jose, Czech capital of Nebraska. Dang, this is wild. The Signpost Forest, which is located in Watson Lake, Yukon, traces its origins to 1942, when U.S. soldier Carl K. Lindley was in town recovering from an injury while working on the Alaska Highway. He put up a sign in this very spot, indicating the direction and distance to his hometown of Danville, Illinois. This trend caught on quickly, and since that time, over 70,000 signs have been added to the forest by travelers using the Alaska Highway from across the world. Just past Watson Lake, next to Upper Leard, is where Route 37, also known as the Cassier Highway, ends and connects to the Alaska Highway. The Cassier Highway is the main route to reach the Alaska Highway from other parts of British Columbia, in the interior or further south, such as Vancouver, but especially if you are coming from the west coast of the United States, from Washington State or elsewhere. While most Americans and travelers in general going to Alaska take the official Alaska Highway from Dawson Creek, quite a few take the Cassier route as well taking you through an endless maze of mountains between the coastal ranges of northern BC and those found west of the northern Canadian Rockies. Given the terrain, it's no surprise this highway also has its fair bit of reported Sasquatch encounters along its route. One such encounter I heard from Alaska Bigfoot investigator Larry Beans Baxter. I had a really interesting um, encounter, an aggressive encounter relayed to me uh, from a gentleman. Uh, it was on Highway 37 coming uh, through British Columbia and he had stopped at a rest area to uh, take a comfort stop and as soon as he stepped out of his vehicle he got really, uh, he just got a bad feeling. He got creeped out. He felt like he was being watched. Uh, so much so that instead of going to the to the uh, vault toilet at the rest area he decided to urinate next to his vehicle and while he was doing that he looks over by the uh, the toilet, the, the bathroom, and sees a Sasquatch standing actually taller than the bathroom, uh, and it's doing the typical, you know, weaving back and forth motion. And uh, he gets scared, uh, gets back in his vehicle, and uh, peels out of the rest area, and it actually uh, chased him, and he said it smacked the side of his truck. And uh, as, as luck would have it, I mean, I just happened to be driving through that area uh, about a year or so, maybe after this guy had given me the report. And uh, I thought, well, you know, why not? I got to go through there. I'll just stop there. Uh, I was on my way back to Alaska from a trip to the Washington to the lower 48. And uh, I thought, oh, I'll stop there. It's around lunchtime. I'll, I'll stop here, have a little picnic, and uh, just kind of make it make an afternoon out of it. So here's the uh, the bathroom that the uh, Bigfoot was standing next to. It's a standard vault toilet. I'm, uh, I'm 5'11", and uh, stick my hand up there, that's about 8 feet, and uh, I can just go over the, the lip of the roof there, so if it was standing here, if it was taller than the roof, it was about 8 foot or more. I was by myself. Uh, I got out of my car, was kind of moving things around, getting my lunch ready, and I uh, just heard this massive tree fall. I mean, just, it, I could hear the branches snapping, it sounded, I thought a rifle had been shot at first, and it was like snap, 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 boom! OK, 
Okay guys, so I'm here at this rest area and I was gonna fix my lunch and eat it here. This is where that siding took place a few years ago. And I just heard a massive tree fall over there. It, it just it scared me uh, i was like holy cow uh the wind wasn't blowing at the time there was uh you know no logical explanation for it uh other than the tree either just fell over or something pushed it over uh knowing what i knew about the area and the aggressive encounter there it, it creeped me out pretty bad so uh, I, I ended up i almost just left but i ended up talking myself into staying uh, i ended up eating lunch in my vehicle instead of uh, at the little picnic table there and um I uh, reached back out to the gentleman who, who had given me the encounter and told him about what had happened to me there. And uh, he said he'd heard of other encounters that had occurred there. And uh, someone in his family had told him that uh, they believed that maybe there was uh, uh, either a juvenile Sasquatch or just a Sasquatch graveyard in general somewhere in that area and that they didn't like people around there and they were protective of the area. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that was interesting. You know, I mean, what are the odds that I'm there investigating an aggressive Bigfoot counter, and then I hear this tree fall over that sounds like a nuke going off in the woods. Uh, you know, maybe it's a coincidence, but uh, it, it was a creepy one and it scared me for sure. Interestingly enough, not far from this location, there was a report on the Canada map of an encounter from 2006 of a truck driver pulled over having dinner at a similar rest stop, getting an eerie feeling of being watched and hearing strange vocalizations and howling that seemed to get closer and closer to him as he had dinner, causing him to leave the area fearfully. This report first appeared in the book Nagani, Tales of the Northern Sasquatch, which would come into play the following day on our trip through the Yukon. Although these encounters happened on the Cassier Highway and not along the official Alaska Highway route, I felt that it was compelling enough to share especially as this is all the same habitat. Aside from our human routes and small outposts throughout this massive region, this place belongs to the wild, which includes the Sasquatch. Now, um, you know, have you heard of any other stories like along the Alaska Highway? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've heard of plenty of uh, roadside crossings on the Alaska Highway. There was um, a woman that I, I used to work with uh, she was moving up uh, from the lower 48 uh, and they would stop and, and sleep in her uh, camper, uh, camp trailer uh, at night on the side of the road while they were traveling through Canada. Uh, not a, you know, not a Bigfoot person, not a, into Bigfoot. Uh, she related a story to me where uh, she heard a noise one night uh, after they'd lay down to go to sleep. She got up, looked out the window and saw something big, hairy, and she said it looked like it was on two feet walking away from the camper. Uh, and that took place on the Alaska Highway. I don't know exactly where, but um, again, you know, not a Bigfoot person, not not something that she was interested in, but uh, you know, she, she knows what she saw and uh, she, she couldn't uh, explain. While we had officially crossed into the Yukon, this section of the Alaska Highway crosses back and forth between British Columbia quite a bit, and as a result, we wouldn't end up further into the Yukon until the morning.
While driving out of camp, we had a Canada Lynx run across the dirt road quite a ways ahead of us. Here is the zoomed in footage, with the Lynx itself being barely visible. All we needed now was for a Sasquatch to do the same. That morning, we headed towards the town of Teslin, Yukon. Looking at the map, this area seemed to have quite a few Sasquatch sightings in and around it, which is something we would come to learn quite a bit about. So this is a Zonaqua mask. Their description there on the side saying, so I'm going to call it Wild Woman, it's kind of like a female Sasquatch depiction amongst these masks. So that's pretty cool. Pretty cool to see here in the wildlife display. So we're here in a little place called Teslin, Yukon. Just went into this really cool little museum, the Northern Wildlife Museum. And uh, I was talking to the lady who works at the desk and she told me some pretty interesting stuff about Sasquatch. I actually noticed there was a Zonaqua mask. So we're talking Zonaqua coming from this kind of Salish tribes, I believe, in the coastal regions of BC. And I asked her about the mask. They had the whole story there, wild woman. She says, oh yeah, I used to get creeped out by the mask. I said, do you know any Sasquatch stories from this area? She says, oh yeah, my grandmother used to talk about it. She said her grandmother was native from this area, Tlingit, I believe, people. And uh, she said that they had found these tracks many years ago and kind of, had, kind of had followed the tracks. So that's kind of interesting. She told me to talk to a guy named Red Grossinger, who's going to be actually at the Boreal Bigfoot Expo. So I'll have to talk to him about all that. I'm originally from Montreal, joined the army uh, back in 1959. Spent 30 years in Kansan forces, made my way through the ranks from tank driver to a squadron commander. Uh, at one time I got stationed in uh, White Horse from 1980-83 and then we just fell in love the place, my wife and three sons. And then we said whenever it's time to retire this is where we're coming back. Been in Yukon since. For a while in Yukon I used to operate a uh, tourist boat on the river between White Horse and Dawson City and then starting 1997 I got in interested in Sasquatch and I've been at it ever since. I like fly fishing and I like especially around the rivers and what have you. I was out fly fishing one day in the Takini River and uh, caught a few fish, grayling, I took grayling then I could hear some noise somewhat behind me on the right. Then I looked and there was something at the edge of the bush. This thing went back in. Then it came out again. Two or three times. Tall, totally covered in hair. And not any animals I could, uh, that I knew of. So I mentioned that to a friend of mine who's a Klangit from the Teslin area of central Yukon. And she said, well, that's a Bushman, Sasquatch. I said, okay, explain to me what it is. <laughs> she did. And then from that day on, I started reading everything. I put my hands on it, joined a number of clubs, uh, group associations. We went out, did a bit of research uh, in BC, as well as Alberta. People heard about me. Then people started sharing their sightings, their encounters, or occurrences, their whatever they had experience in the bush that could be related to Sasquatch. So in my files, I got over 150 reports. And at one time, someone said, what are you gonna do with all these? I said, basically, I don't know. I don't have any plan. And anyway, somebody suggested I should write a book about it. And it worked out from there. Finally, last October, the book was published. And uh, there it is. Unlike British Columbia, where Sasquatch is deeply culturally rooted, the Yukon is virtually unknown when it comes to the topic. 
it became clear to me that Red was the perfect person to talk to about Sasquatch in this region. In general, the Yukon is overlooked, especially by its two neighbors, British Columbia and Alaska, both of which attract attention worldwide for their natural beauty, among other things. There's only 45,000 people in an area of 186.2 uh, miles, 86,000 square miles that is, uh, very large, one third of the size of Alaska, and there's only a couple of highways going through there, Alaska Highway being the main one, and there's a few roads coming out, but that's it, the rest of it is pure wilderness. So there's a lot of stuff in there that we don't know about. The area around Teslin is one that Red is quite familiar with when it comes to Sasquatch. Yeah, around Teslin, of course, I know quite a few people and uh, they keep me in, usually informed. In 1978, this uh, gentleman from Teslin was returning uh, to Teslin from White Horse after shopping. About 9 o'clock at night, he was coming around uh, top of the hill and there's just a bit below there was something standing right beside the road. He thought it was a hitchhiker. So he pulled right beside it, just to find out it was a Sasquatch standing there. So needless to say, it didn't give him a ride. <laughs> there was some others as well. A couple, uh, First Nation gentleman with his wife, they were going back home from Teslin, they lived about 10 miles outside of town. Uh, they were riding an ATV in the ditch beside the road. They noticed something on the road, so they slow down, figuring maybe someone there needs a ride. So they pull on the road, and there was a Sasquatch who crossed the road in about three steps and disappeared. In 2013, one, uh, one person that knew me said you should come to Teslin and talk to this couple, First Nation couple. And they, what they had experienced is that uh, earlier that year, they were out fishing. And then they were planning to pull out on shore to have lunch. It was a tiny small beach, beautiful place. And actually I was there in 1914, 2014 when I investigated. Anyway, as they pulled in, uh, there were two Sasquatch they saw on top of this hill, right beside the shore, throwing rocks at them, basically trying to keep them away from landing. So they got the message, backed up and went somewhere else. Cool, we're still here in Teslin, just went to the cultural center for the Tlingit people here. Pretty cool to see some of the costumes and some of the artwork and the similarities I noticed to other other types of artwork in this area, but unique. But I asked the lady who worked in there about any Sasquatch stories, anything. She said, oh, there are sightings, but most people are too scared to talk about it, which I find interesting as opposed to other areas of Canada and even the U.S. where little bit more uh, widely accepted, at least from places I've been, talked to folks that have said, yeah, you know, we have sightings and they openly talk about it here. She said that there are sightings, but people are scared to talk about it. So more of the same seems to be the case in a lot of different places. As we drove further into the Yukon and closer to Alaska, we began to lay our eyes on mountains that just looked different from the ones we had seen thus far. These were peaks belonging to the St. Elias Range, which is the tallest coastal mountain range on Earth. These epic mountains straddle the borders between the Yukon and the start of the Alaskan Panhandle. They also contain the largest ice fields in the world after the polar ice caps. The 
This area was as well peppered with Sasquatch reports directly on the Alaska Highway. One report from 1927 describes a Bushman being seen near Destruction Bay. Another incident from 2011 listed on the map was documented by Red Grossinger. Actually, there was one not too far from uh, Destruction Bay where a couple from Southern State somewhere, anyway, they had been spending vacation here, they were driving back. They found a place to pull off on the Alaska Highway, close to a bridge. Uh, there was a fairly high bank river. And as they were pulling off and resting, something threw a rock in the water. And they didn't know where it was. And then another rock, they seen this rock come in this time. So they figured it wasn't safe. And they carried on down the road. Since it was our final night in Canada, we figured we would explore the area a bit and camp between some of the sighting locations. We were checking out this cool area. Got what I believe is a smaller black bear here. See three tracks going right up here. Yeah, here's a really good black bear print. So yeah, just toes. So we've got the black bear right there. Here we've got a moose. Following this grizzly track line, we think it may be grizzly. Pretty big. We got the toes there, claws going into there. Tracks leading right back here. Yep, got two right here. I mean, that's either a really big black bear or a grizzly bear. Yeah, there's a pad right here. That looks like a back. You do a goofy little mini burger. Burger's barely, <laughs> barely in there. But hey, it works. Meal with a few. We had a couple of hours left until we would hit the Alaskan border. This section of the highway seemed to be in the roughest of shape, likely due to frost heaves from heavy winters. This whole area by the border just had a feeling of desolation for some reason. Even though most of the Alaska Highway felt this way, this place just amplified the feeling. The border between Alaska and Canada is over 1,500 miles long, contributing to the U.S.-Canada border, which is the largest national border on Earth. Well, today's the final stretch. We are very close to the Alaska border. We actually technically passed the Canadian Customs. There's 20 kilometers, I think, between Canadian customs and the US customs. So we're about to cross into Alaska and then we've got uh, another four or so hours up to Fairbanks. So we'll be completing the rest of the Alaska Highway today. Pretty exciting. It's been absolutely stunning so far in the Canadian section. As we finally reached the Alaska sign, it was an incredible feeling. I had always dreamed of driving to Alaska, and doing it from the east coast of the United States was quite an unforgettable journey.
pounds over there. And here's the boundary. location of the East Lodge Swatch. Well, just made it into Alaska. It's funny, the border agent was inquiring why we were coming up here and I'm telling him, looking for Sasquatch, speaking at the Sasquatch conference in Fairbanks this weekend and he asked if I knew Michael Thompson who is going to be at the conference, who uh, is a Sasquatch tracker. He, we interviewed him last year when we were up here when we were doing the other Sasquatch related projects on the trail of Bigfoot and all that stuff so um, it'd be cool to see him and I guess he used to work at this border crossing so that's kind of interesting. Uh, daytime crossing uh, not sure of the year but it's kind of why I got back into it I kind of went through a period of non-interest in my life I want to say it was maybe 2003 2004 maybe um, I just decided to you know, I don't know what it was but hey, I should just look up Bigfoot activity in this area. And there was one that was at Gardner Creek, which is like a 15 minute drive from the border. And I'm like, you, you gotta be kidding me. I have to go look at this one. And that's where I kind of got started back into it. So yeah, there's, there's sightings that happen along the highway in that area, definitely. Since 2005, Michael has collected an impressive collection of Alaskan Sasquatch reports on his website, sasquatchtracker.com. With reports dating back to the late 1800s and early 1900s to the modern day from across Alaska. He's very familiar with the Yukon Alaska border area in particular. There's a Tetland Visitor Center also, Tetland Refuge Visitor Center about seven miles from the border. They get a lot of stories too and they relate some of that stuff to me. As we transition away from the Canada sightings map and move on to the Bigfoot mapping project to see reports for Alaska, we see the presence of four reported Sasquatch encounters between the border and the town of Toke, all directly along the Alaska Highway. Uh, there's lots of stories about, you know, running across the road at night. Of course, the midnight sun, so it's not really dark, you know, the two in the morning thing. Uh, one in particular that it seems to be one that I remember the most because I hear tons of stories. A, a truck driver, commercial truck driver, and this is on the, the uh, other side of Toke, so not the border side, but the the Delta side of Toke. Uh, two, or two or three in the morning, he's thinking he's seen a moose that's walking away from him, trotting away. Um, sees a big wide butt of a moose, and then the moose has a hump on its neck to support the antlers and whatever, a big thing. So it looks like a sagittal crest, so he thinks that he's seen this moose jogging down the side of the road, uh, and then it turns and crosses the road and you realize it's it's not a moose because it's up on two legs a, a human-like figure and that really stuck out in my mind because this guy was a former state trooper not that people don't lie because of their jobs but this guy had some credibility with me having been a law enforcement officer there was no reason for him to lie to me for something like that what I find intriguing between the work of Michael Thompson and Red Grossinger is that they are both covering such wide swaths of desolate landscape that aside from our human boundaries is really the same habitat for the creatures that reside there. Some of the reports that both Red and Michael have taken from the border region itself could very well be the same Sasquatches venturing across the sparsely guarded border. I got a lot of uh, encounters about things being stolen from smokehouses. Uh, a lot of uh, one in particular was a daytime encounter. Uh, the guy witnessed the Sasquatch and played peekaboo with him. I uh, didn't really realize what was going on until later on. Then he started sensing danger and kind of went back into the house to avoid it. There's some uh, a lot of bear hunting activity out there, that kind of thing. A lot of caribou migration that goes through there, so I look for kill sites and things like this and monitor that kind of thing. Always looking for scavenger activity. Um, 
there's a strong native presence out there and it takes a little bit of work to have a good rapport with them it's always something that you gotta kind of always maintain and work on uh, some mining activity out there right now with Kinross going on towards the Tetlin area uh, looking for stuff that's maybe related to that some kind of where there's human activity there seems to be Sasquatch activity so how I met him is I have his I bought his first book the Sasquatch research manual and I thought this guy lives in Whitehorse so I did contact him and uh, we did keep in contact for a little bit and we've gone through you know periods of where we don't speak to each other not out of anger or anything like that but you know life gets in the way of things but uh uh, he's got a lot of interesting stories about the Yukon, and that's right on the border. You know, that's my neck of the woods, too, so yes. Oh, the only one I heard of was recently, uh, was something that happened actually in 2004, uh, of these four hunters that came across a female Sasquatch with a young one. Uh, these gentlemen, uh, the elders of the First Nation around Eagle, Alaska, they went out hunting, and one day they were setting up camp just about at the, at the border between uh, the, the, the Yukon and Alaska. They were along the Yukon River. And as two guys were unloading the boat, two others went out to pick up wood to set up campfire. And then they came across a female Sasquatch with a young one. First off, they heard that young one crying. So they walked to it, uh, figuring it was another family that was there. No, it was a Sasquatch. When the female noticed them, she put the young one on her back, uh, and then she went by the Yukon River, gathered a few dead trees, and threw herself right on the water and swam across the Yukon River. So that's the one at the border itself. The story of the juvenile Sasquatch crying reminded me of the alleged baby crying audio at Area A on the Kenai Peninsula of Alaska. In that case at Area A, that sound was only heard on a few occasions when women were present. Whereas in this case on the Alaska-Yukon border, it was a group of First Nations men. Per some of the stories I've heard from First Nations people in Alaska, the sound of a baby crying is tied to the stories of the Kushtaka and the Hairy Man. Just something interesting to note. If you want to hear more about Area A, be sure to check out my new ongoing series, Dark Coast, as well as parts one and two of the Alaskan Coastal Sasquatch from last year. As we journeyed on into Alaska, we completed the entirety of the nearly 1,400 mile long Alaska Highway. At the time, we did not realize that there was an official marker noting the end of the Alaska Highway in Delta Junction, Alaska. So we didn't have a chance to see that as we traveled onwards for the city of Fairbanks. While in Fairbanks for that weekend, I was joined by Eli and we participated in the Boreal Bigfoot Expo screening some films, and joining a host of speakers, including Larry Beans Baxter, Red Grossinger, Michael Thompson, and others. They'd never seen an ape before. I thought, well, maybe when they saw Bigfoot, they can identify it with an otter. It looks like an otter, so they call it an otter man. That's kind of what I thought. But the, the more you look into the, the Hushtika, a lot of them think it's a shapeshifter and has all these paranormal powers and whatnot. And it moves about as if it's grasping these uh, um, supports, limbs and branches with four hands. As part of the speaker panel, we got to answer some questions. Here was my answer to a question about suitable habitat for Sasquatch. Yeah, it's tough to say that there's really a place that a lot, I mean, there's certainly areas like Bluff Creek or like Beans just mentioned, the Olympic Peninsula gets a lot of attention, Washington, the Pacific Northwest, 
great habitat, don't get me wrong. I mean, essentially extending from the Kenai Peninsula down through British Columbia to Northern California, you have this temperate rainforest habitat. Probably one of the best places in the world for something Sasquatch-like, but um, I may be biased, but I found an area that's particularly interesting to me because I'm from there and it's not covered a lot is the, the northern part of New England. So that would be northern New Hampshire and Maine, which is uh, has the most amount of moose in the United States outside of Alaska. Here is Eli's answer to a question about woolly mammoths being a cryptid in Alaska. Yeah, I'm going to give you a fun answer. <laughs> my dream, so I play guitar, and my dream is to make a guitar out of like the rarest things I can find. And uh, what you got to help me out here. It's where the, the string, it's that white piece. Sometimes they make it out of ivory, sometimes it's bone. Uh -huh. Where the strings fit. The nut or the bridge? The nut or the bridge. The nut or the bridge, yeah. I not only want to find a woolly mammoth, I want to take a piece of its tusk and make the bridge of a guitar with it. <laughs> Overall, it was a fun event and a great way to conclude our travels across the Alaska Highway and kick off the month I would be spending up in Alaska. At the event, I heard a lot of interesting Alaskan Bigfoot stories from witnesses and researchers alike. Some of it would lead to investigations that will be featured in upcoming Bigfoot Beyond the Trail episodes. So as we conclude this leg of the journey, I wanted to share my final thoughts. We completed the Alaska Highway in three and a half days, which some might consider a speed run, but with limited time, we did what we could. That being said, I still feel as though we experienced so much and got to see so many of the sights that make the Alaska Highway special. This is a map I put together of Sasquatch sightings and clusters of sightings directly along the route, just from the online sources I featured throughout the video, primarily being Kerry Kilmurray's Canada Sasquatch map and the Bigfoot Mapping Project, not including sightings reported by Larry Beans Baxter, Red Grossinger, or Michael Thompson. While there are some stretches of the Alaska Highway with no reported sightings, Virtually all of this area is more than suitable habitat for most of the large wildlife found along this route. In my view, that could easily include Sasquatch as well. As is generally common with Sasquatch sightings around North America, road crossing sightings are very prevalent on the Alaska Highway. Perhaps it is because of its presence as one of the only major roads through one of the most remote regions of the continent. Or perhaps it has to do with the large amounts of prey species and food sources that can be seen from the road itself. It is hard to say. Even though most of this highway goes through northern Canada, between the sightings documented along the route were the Sasquatch coincidences that took place to me while I traveled, between learning of Red Grossinger and Teslin, or about Michael Thompson at the border crossing, or even all the stories I heard after the fact, there was a reason I chose to call this place the Alaska Bigfoot Highway. So people missing in Alaska. Uh, this is a hot topic because it happens pretty frequently. We have something called uh, Inyokun. It can take you. I don't know where they take you. They're dark, like black. They are hairy, kind of like a Bigfoot. Is it possible that some of these missing people go missing because of another monster, the Sasquatch? I think it's entirely possible um, because Sasquatches are not your forest friend. They are animals trying to survive. If Sasquatch really wanted to, and in considering people like me or, or even just people in suburbia, if they wanted to, they could push people out of rural areas back to population centers. A lot of the Alaska Native, the superstition is that if, if you're in their territory, they will take you. 
and they were just hanging out in the cabin. Well, they heard a noise up on the roof, and then something was going on just outside the door, and it lured them out. Death by Alaska is real common. You get a mile away from the village, that's death out there. Alaska can kill you without even trying.